I can't hear you. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your happy people, for your joyful people, victorious people. We pray, Lord, this work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, you touch everybody's life. Transform us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to do what you expect us to do as leaders in, and pastors, women leaders, and uh, campus people, and uh, all our youths and children leaders. In Jesus' name, let your anointing be upon every life. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. Here you'll find that the Lord talks about the pastor. And some Tuesdays ago, we've uh, spoken about the evangelist as well as the teacher. And tonight, we're concentrating on the ministry of the pastor. It says in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 And I will give you pastors according to my heart Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding You see here when the Lord promised that he'll give pastors He also revealed what the ministry of those pastors will be He said primarily and in a very focused and pointed way that those uh, pastors will be according to his heart and that they will feed the people of God with knowledge and understanding. Take note of that. If we don't have the knowledge ourselves, we cannot feed others with the knowledge. And if we do not have understanding, we cannot feed other people with understanding. And then in Jeremiah chapter 23, Reading from verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse, tw verse 4. It tells us in verse 4, it says, And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and uh, they shall not, they shall fear no more. And then it goes on to say, And that they will not be dismayed, and neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. He uses the word shepherds there because shepherds are pastors. Pastors are shepherds. Those words are used interchangeably in the scriptures. And so if we say you're a pastor, then we say you're a shepherd. And it says the shepherd will feed the people of God. And that when he feeds them, there'll be no fear of evil. And then they'll be lacking, they'll be lacking in nothing. Tonight we're looking at the personal development of an excellent pastoral ministry the personal development of an excellent pastoral ministry let me say a word about the pastoral ministry before i go on you shouldn't think that only somebody is leading a congregation like a pastor that's the only person we're talking about if you have a group of people you're leading and you're feeding them the word of, word of God, and you're feeding them with knowledge, and you are helping them to grow and to develop in the Lord, then you feed into this pastoral ministry we're talking about. In a little house fellowship, you're a pastor over that house fellowship. And in a zone, you're a pastor over that zone. And in the district, you're a pastor over that district. If you're a woman leader, you're a pastor, you're a shepherd over those women you are leading. So all this is we're talking about will concern you as well. Or you're a language leader. It's the same thing. Those uh, people you are leading, they come under your pastoral ministry. Of course, those who are leading are youths, and those who are leading the students and the children were pastors. And we're leading those people in the way of the Lord. And it says, if we're pastors, we'll be men and women at God's heart. Not only that, we'll be people that are feeding the ch people of God or the children of God with knowledge and understanding. The pastoral development That means then, or the personal development Rather, personal development You need to develop yourself We're going to look at the responsibilities of pastors And we're going to look at what pastors are And then you look at all this And you look at your own profile Look at your life and look at your ministry And see how those things tally How those things come together And then you'll say, I think I need development In this area or that area And the Lord will grant us The anointing of the grace 
and the strength to be everything we ought to be in Jesus' name. And the personal development of an excellent pastoral ministry. The three points we're going to consider. Number one, the purpose of the pastoral ministry. What do we have the pastoral ministry? Why are you a pastor? Why are you a leader? Why are you having an oversight over the people of God? Why are you in that zone? Why are you in that district? And why are you in that section of the work? Is the why we're answering in this place. And it's the purpose. The purpose of the pastoral ministry. Number two is the personification of, of the pastoral minister. The personification of the pastoral minister. Minister, you cannot be a pastor in isolation or in theory. You cannot just be a pastor in an abstract sense. There are people that say they are pastors. They don't have any congregation. They are not leading anybody. And they cannot tell us in a week that this is what I've done in relationship to the pastoral ministry. It must be personal and it must be practical there must be a kind of a handle on each that you can say that's a pastor that's a shepherd the personification of the pastoral minister and then number three is the price of the pastoral ministry that's the price to pay and if you are not willing to actually pay the price and if you are not willing to discipline yourself and school yourself and uh, kind of put some pressure on yourself so that you can be all you ought to be. You will not uh, be an effective uh, minister as a pastor. The price of the pastoral ministry. We're coming to number one. What's number one there? It's the purpose of the pastoral ministry. Let, let's look at Jeremiah again, chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 1, it, from verse 15. It says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Just like when he chose David. And he said, I'm, gi I'm giving you David a man after mine own heart. You know the passion of the heart of God. The desires of the heart of God. The delight of the heart of God. And the thing that makes him to want a pastor or a king. And he says, I'm going to give you pastors in the plural. Which means it's not just one pastor. That will be a man after God's own heart. It means every pastor, all the pastors. You're a man, you're a woman, whoever you are. And you want to be a man that pleases God. A man that delights God. A man that does everything that God wants him to do. He says, I'm going to give you pastors. Whichever location you are, whichever place you are, and whichever state you belong to, and whatever it is, you may be doing among young people, among adult people, among families. It says, I want pastors out of my own heart. And it says, which shall feed you. That's the number one thing. Feed you of the word of God. Well, you're not there to entertain the people. You're not there to page the people. You're not there to prop the people. You're there to feed the people with the word of God. And then it says with knowledge and understanding. You feed them with knowledge and with understanding. You begin to check up yourself. You begin to check up on your ministry. Whenever you preach and whenever you teach, do you teach the word of God? Are the people fed? Are the people satisfied? Or are they still saying, I don't understand that. I didn't get that. I didn't see that. I didn't feel that. And there's no feeling in their heart. And there is no satisfaction in their soul. It says that when we're feeding the people of God, the people will know I came for something and I got something. You must always check up when you preach and when you teach and when you proclaim the word of God. How is it feeding the lives of the people? Jeremiah chapter 23, I'm reading from verse, five, from verse 4. It says, and I will set up shepherds over them. I, the Lord said himself, I'm the one that will set up the shepherds over them, which shall feed them. Again, he emphasizes the fact that it's to feed the people. It's not to whip the people, discipline the people, scatter the people, oppress the people 
and be militant over the people the very first thing you are to do is that you feed the people with the word of god it says i'm going to set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and shall and they shall fear no more they shall fear no more well as you look at your ministry and as you look at what you are sharing as you look at the things you are telling the people are you helping them to be free free from the fear of, of the world and free from the fear of uh, the devil and free from the fear of whatever it is they had that uh, made them frightened or afraid before it says they shall fear no more and so as we minister you're feeding them how do you feed the people that they fear no more with the words of faith the promises of god or the goodness of god or the remembrance of what god has done in the past and what God is still going to do, even at the present and in the future. And it's when you feed people with the word of faith, and the word of life, and the word of comfort, and the word of courage, and the word that brings confidence into their hearts. That's when you are doing the work of the pastor. And it says, after I said that they shall fear no more, it says, not be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. When you look at their lives and say, spiritually, are they lacking in salvation? Are they lacking in righteousness? Are they lacking in holiness? Are they lacking in peace in their families? Are they lacking in uh, wherewithal they feed themselves? And it says you supply the need in all those areas because that's the reason why, that's the purpose why the Lord has called you to be a pastor. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 28. It says in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. That's just another word for pastor, another word for shepherd. It's made you a leader. And it says to so take heed unto yourself and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you pastors to do what? Tell me out loud to feed the church of god you see the emphasis in the word of god it says that if you're a pastor you're feeding the people you're nurturing the people you're nourishing the people it says uh, to feed the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood they are purchased property purchased sheep purchased flock and purchase people they're the people who have been purchased with the blood of the lord jesus christ and they're so precious to the lord and it says what you need to do as a pastor is feed them nurture them nourish them encourage them and train them and teach them the word of god so that the knowledge they receive will strengthen their christian lives we're looking at first peter chapter 5 First Peter chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 2. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you. Over and over, Old Testament, New Testament, Acts of the Apostles, Epistles, it's telling us the same thing that the work of the pastor and the ministry of the pastor is to feed the flock is to feed the church is to feed the people of god with the word of god and, and again remember it doesn't matter where where you are ministering it doesn't matter the section of people you're ministering to well I sometimes we think that because i'm ministering in this area this area does not need uh, the feeding with the word of god already they have enjoyed the bible study on monday already they have enjoyed everything we're doing on tuesday and maybe on saturday and maybe on sunday and then this is just our own area of work now and then we develop some programs and some projects that doesn't relate to feeding the people with the word of god it says no if you're occupying a pastoral role 
alone a pastoral ministry the pastor the shepherd the leader is to feed the people with the word of god look at that verse 2 again feed the flock that's an imperative that's a commandment that's something that says this is what to do and it says you feed the flock of god which is among you taking the oversight thereof not by constraint but willingly and not fulfill the looker but of a ready mind that's just saying that you're not doing it for money you're not doing it for mo monetary gain or financial gain or material gain you're doing it because the lord has appointed you and the lord has called you and this is what he wants you to do and it says neither has been on lords over god's heritage what does that mean neither has been lords over god's heritage there are some people that have this idea as if they own the church the local church or the state church or the region church or the national church they own the church like a property and therefore they are able to do whatever they want of that church and that's why you hear about milking the church that's how you hear about oppressing the church that's how you hear about other atrocities that are done but here the lord is saying he didn't send us to oppress the church he didn't send us to fleece the church he didn't send us, send us to do anything oppressive for the church it's saying that you neither be you'll not be like lords over god's heritage but you will be what examples to the flock the things were teaching we also demonstrated the things we're teaching we also show to the people that here is how to carry it out and then it says and when the chief shepherd that's another word for the pastor but now this is referring to the lord when the chief shepherd shall appear ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away i pray that will not miss our rewards in jesus name and uh, you come to first thessalonians chapter 2 first thessalonians chapter 2 i will see the attitude of paul the apostle because he was a pastor over the thessalonian believers and here is how he shared his own experience and is giving us uh, an example as to how and what we should follow first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 chapter 2 verse 7 here it says but we were gentle among you even as the nurse cherishes her children we pastors we leaders we apostles we who are to feed the church of god were gentle among you as a nurse a nursing mother cherishes her children and so you understand the kind of uh, attitude we ought to have the tenderness we ought to have and uh, the nursing mother's characteristics we ought to have as we're leading the people of god and as we're helping the people of god to have and to know and to uh, do what they ought to do it tells us in uh, verse 8 after he has said what gentle among you what tender among you what meek among you it says so being affectionately desirous of you well we're willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of god that is yes we're imparting the gospel of god we're teaching you we're telling you about the gospel of grace about the gospel of godliness about the gospel that leads you to glory about the gospel of salvation and about the gospel that makes your life a better life that brings you to christ a new creature in christ and all things becoming new but since we go beyond that we're willing also to impart unto you our own souls because ye were dear and priceless and precious unto us see what the lord is telling us he's saying that if we are pastors you don't come in as just a kind of a, an outside teacher 
I just come to teach the people and whatever happens to them doesn't matter to me because they're just students. And then you just come in and you deliver your lecture and then you're away. It says that's not the pastoral work. The pastoral work is that you make the people so precious to you and so dear to you and so priceless to you that you're sharing the word of God and sharing your very heart and sharing your very life and sharing everything you've got so that the people will know that that's a father that's a mother that's a nurse that's somebody who's so gentle and wants me to have everything i ought to have so as to make it on the final day and they're willing to share not just the gospel not just knowledge they're willing to share their very heart then it says in verse 10 uh, ye are witnesses and god also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe look up here you know sometimes if you have little children and there are some things you might do by yourself if you are by yourself not that they are wrong just that they are not proper if you are training children but when children are there there are some things you will not talk about there are some things you will not share because you don't want those children to hear that and pick that up let's say for example you are eating on the table and uh, you are teaching you want your children to know about the table manners there are some ways in which you will not eat there are some things you will not do you say children don't talk while you eat and when you tell the children that you are conscious yourself you have a reason for telling them and the reason you are telling them is so that the food will not go the wrong direction and give them a problem but you an adult you can control that but all the same because you are teaching those children you make yourself an example the same thing for a pastoral work the same thing for a leader a woman leader a man who is a leader a youth leader or whatever anything you do and everything you do it becomes an example Example to those uh, people that were leading that's why it says ye are witnesses and God also how we behaved ourselves among you and they're not people that come to the fellowship and they forget their pastors they forget their leaders they forget that they have oversight over some congregation and the examples they lay actually those are not examples you want every other person to follow but it says that if we're pastors we live holily and righteously and unblameably among the people of god in second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 2 and it says that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also timothy uh, was being addressed here as a pastor it wasn't just to preach it was also to teach it wasn't only to teach it was also to train and to develop people and to reproduce himself among the people that's why i said everything you have heard everything you know and all the things you have been made assured of it says you will be able to bring other people to you who will also teach other people like you're doing and then in verse 24 in verse 24 here is uh, what the lord is expecting of the pastor and of the leader it says and the servant of the lord must not strive hmm. the servant of the lord must not strive the shepherd does not strive or the sheep the shepherd does not strive with the flock and the shepherd does not strive with the people is leading we're leading and of course the followers do not strive with the shepherds it looks like the people that forget their calling we forget why we're there and we forget why we came to the church as born again people as children of god and as the pastor forgets that pastor in quotes it comes and it's like it comes to fight comes to fight everybody and then there's some members too it's like some of the members come and they say today i'm going to do something the church is not for a fight the church is for nourishing the church is for nurturing the church is for feeding and the church is for teaching and the church is for training people the church is for preparing people for heaven and that's why it says and the servant of the lord must not strive but what's the next word there be gentle be gentle 
You need to learn that if you've not known how to be gentle. It says to be gentle unto how many people there now? All men apt to teach, ready to teach, skilled to teach, prepared to teach, trained to teach. That's what it means there. And patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness, helping the people that oppose themselves. What does that mean, oppose themselves? They are running a race, and they ought to be looking at the direction they are running. And they ought to be looking at the goal. Instead of looking at the goal, they're looking back. They're looking sideways. They're looking at other things. They're looking at distractions. And they will miss their ways. And they are the people that will fall by the wayside. They'll not be able to get to the end of the journey because they're not looking at the direction of that goal. They oppose themselves. They injure themselves. And then it's the pastor that will come and put them right and say, this is the direction to follow in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will keep them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil that's what we do we who are pastors we who are leaders you help the people to recover themselves from the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will as we look at all the references we have in scripture concerning you know, the ministry of the pastor look at what the pastor does number one the pastor feeds the people feeds the people number two the pastor seeks the people that you find in ezekiel chapter 34 seeks the people you find them out you seek for them it's not that you are waiting for them if they didn't come to church whatever happened to them that's uh, you know their bad luck or good luck but you seek after them and there uh, are many ways today we can seek and then we teach the pastors teach you feed that's number one you you seek for them that's number two number three you teach number four you want them you want the unruly you want the backsliders you warn the people that are not taking heed to the word of God. You warn the people that are going and having the tendency of backsliding. Number five, you comfort. Those who are sorrowful, those who are sick, those who are bereaved, you comfort them. And then number six, to strengthen the people who are weak. Members who are weak, they're weak in knowledge, they're weak in experience. The weak in their in their lives generally will strengthen them. Number seven, we love them. You love them to the point you are willing to share the gospel with them. You love them to the point you are willing to share your very soul with them. You love them to the point you are willing to put yourself to discomfort and inconvenience so that you can feed them and help them. Number eight, you rescue them. They get into trouble rescue them that's the work of the pastor it says you rescue the perishing number nine you protect them you protect them from danger you protect them from false doctrine you protect them from any evil that will endanger their lives number 10 you pray for them pray for them you pray for the people many times you'll find paul the apostle saying i mention you every time in my prayers I mentioned you before the throne of grace. Every time I remember you, I pray for you. It was during the ministry of the pastor. And as you think of uh, your ministry as a pastor, your ministry as a leader, remember once again, not only the people that stand behind the pulpit like we're doing tonight, not only those people, but everyone that has oversight over a group of people. Have you done that? Have you been doing that? And this is something for us to check up and to say, I want to be a better pastor and a better leader and a better shepherd, and the Lord will make it possible in Jesus' name. What do you do as a pastor? What do you do as a person who has oversight over the people of God? Number one, you bring sinners to God. Bring sinners to God. That's a great commission. 
That's what the Lord has given us to do. It is not just sending other people out and say, you go do this, but you yourself, you do that. And uh, as you look at this year now, one quarter of the year is already gone. Have you brought one single soul to the Lord? One single soul into the kingdom. One single soul into salvation. You bring sinners to God. Number two, you birth souls with the gospel birth souls with the gospel as you listen to paul the apostle talking to the galatians look at galatians chapter 4 galatians chapter 4 i'm reading here from verse 19 galatians chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 19 in galatians chapter 4 verse 19 it says my little children of whom i travail in birth again travail in birth again for you because uh, these uh, people uh, they were backsliding and because they were backsliding he said i'm traveling again i want to birth you with the gospel again the pure gospel again the true gospel again the transforming gospel again number one what's the job of the pastor bring souls to god number two what's the ministry of the pastor but souls what the gospel number three bring seekers into grace bring seekers into grace there are people that do not have the grace of god in their lives grace for salvation and grace for overcoming temptation and grace for sanctification and grace to taste of the sufficiency of the lord and what's the pastor to do the pastor is to lead them gently and to lead them according to the teaching of the word of god and bring those seekers to grace and more grace all the time number four is to build up sons or to build up sisters to grow to go to glow that is you find those who are in the church brothers and sisters the sons, those are the brothers, the sisters, those are the ladies, and they come to know the Lord. And what do you do? You know that you have a job to do. You are building them up with what you are teaching. That's why we don't just teach haphazardly. You see, there must be like a curriculum. There must be like a syllabus. There must be, I'm upgrading what I am doing. I teach at this level. And then because I know the people I'm talking to, I bring a greater level. And then a greater level because we're building up. There are people that they expect that, you know, we say the same thing all the time. We have the same approach. All the, You don't do that. Because you're building up people and you want to build up people number one to grow in the lord listening to the same thing hearing the same thing every time will not make us to grow that's why you need to grow and develop yourself so that you can help other people to grow not only that they grow you want them to go you want them not just to sit and say i have knowledge i have understanding I understand that now you want them to take whatever they have learned and to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature that's the reason you're building them up so that number one they grow number two they go number three they glow so that their lights will shine let your light so shine before me so that they will see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven number one is to do what bring sinners to god number two is to birth souls so the gospel number three is to seek uh, to bring seekers to more grace number four is to build up sons and sisters to go to grow and to glow number five is to burden soul winners to go body soul winners to go we must put the fire in the people put the fire put the zeal put the passion in the people we're leading we ourselves should be dreaming and we should be passionate zealous of the people that are outside there so as to bring them to the gospel and you pass the fire on and you pass the passion on and you pass the zeal on so that the thing that is burning in you will burn in them as well you burden soul winners to go number six is to bind saints to godliness 
Number six is to bind saints. The people of God, the members of the church, bind them to godliness. That uh, they'll be inseparable from godliness. They will know the grace of God is there to lead us into godliness. And that godliness will be a part of their lives. They will know that this is a non-negotiable. That I'm a child of God. There must be that character of God and the character of godliness in my lives. And then number seven, prepare the church for glory. Prepare the church for glory. Prepare the church for glory. Hold on. Think about your life. If people were just to look at your life alone, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you appear, the way you relate, will that bring the people who look at you to the glory of God and to make the rapture? If people were to listen to, let's say for example, there's no other message to listen to, and you are the only person that those members of the church are listening to, are those messages enough to build them up? Are they enough to prepare them for glory and to prepare them for heaven if they had no other teacher, no other pastor, no other person to feed them, no other person to counsel them no other person to help them if you were the only person as a brother as a sister that this little congregation is attached to will everything you do be enough to make those people to get to glory that's what you'll be thinking about or shouldn't be thinking well they have that other pastor they have that other pastor they have this they have that no think about yourself that you are the solitary person the lord has raised up and he has given you all these people around you to leave them as you do all this i believe god will use you and will lead the people to rapture, will lead them to the kingdom, and will lead them to glory in Jesus' name. Number two, now, what's number two over there? The personification of the pastoral ministry. Personification of the pastoral ministry. What we're doing is, we're asking ourselves, if I look at a pastor as a person, what do I see? Number one, I see the P there is a preacher. It's a preacher. It cannot be a pastor if it's not a preacher. It shouldn't lay claim to the ministry of the pastor if he's not a preacher. The P in the pastor there means that he is a preacher. A preacher. And A, I look at him, I see him as an ambassador. An ambassador is representing Christ, representing God, representing the kingdom of God, representing the heavenly country, and he comes to the country over here on earth, and he's uh, bringing them from the country on earth, he's bringing them to heaven, he is an ambassador, as he's a shepherd. I see the shepherd there. And you see the shepherd in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's a young girl, a young lady uh, that is uh, leading the flock. Or sometimes a young man like uh, David that is leading the flock. But whether a man or a woman, the pastor is supposed to be a shepherd. And then the chief there, the pastor must be a teacher. The pastor must be a teacher. It cannot be somebody who is confused in his mind. Somebody who is unorganized in his mind. Somebody who is not convinced of the truth in his mind. He must know the truth. And he must have that truth. He must be able to put the truth line upon line and precept upon precept. Because the pastor is a teacher. The pastor is an overseer. It's an overseer. He cannot just say, well, I'm teaching the Bible. And then he does not supervise. He does not oversee. He does not look at the lives of people. And sometimes our members don't understand that we pastors, that we're overseers. Overseers is to over, overseer is to oversee. Is to see something over your shoulders. Is to look at your life. Is to look at your family. And is to ask questions. You know, sometimes if, uh, you know, the pastor will ask, what's your name? What's the pastor asking of my name? What does he need my name for? Are you married? Are you not married? How does the pastor want to know that? Because we're overseers. We need to know what's going on in your life. We need to know how you're standing. And we need to know what area do we need to help you. That's the overseer. We see your deficiencies. We see your lack. And then we see how we're to help you. It's an overseer and are there he is a restorer he is a restorer he is the one that is going out there and is bringing them back he's bringing them back and is compelling them to come back so that my house will be full the pastor p tell me 
is a preacher a tell me s tell me t tell me o tell me and r tell me why is the pastor asking us of all that she already were preaching and knows just assume that we have we have done everything and be a lecturer the pastor is not a lecturer the pastor interacts with his people the pastor gives out the knowledge he feeds the people and then he wants to know whether they have got what he's feeding them with there must be that interaction i must be sure that what we're talking about is getting into you and thank god we have evidence is getting into you more and more in jesus name now the p is the preacher we're looking at romans chapter 10 romans chapter 10 and i'm reading from verse 14 romans chapter 10 we're reading from verse 14 in verse 14 here is what is telling us it says in verse 14 how then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher how shall they hear without a preacher? Before they can be saved, they must believe. Before they can believe, they must hear. What are we to believe? And before they hear, there must be somebody telling them about Christ. Telling them about the Savior. Telling them about the one who died for them. That's why there's a necessity to be a preacher. And then it says in verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful at the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that preach the gospel of conflict, that preach the gospel of fighting. Hey, look at some pastors as you see them on the pulpit. It's like we have forgotten our calling. There's somebody there in the congregation and uh, you know we've heard about something that shouldn't have been done and we came here today and we neglect the 99 people that remain out of 100 and that solitary person we're knocking him and the fellow knows we're knocking him the fellow knows we're at him today the fellow knows and the fellow is trying to dodge and we keep on knocking until we, we make uh, the act to open up and swallow him up that's not the ministry that's not the ministry the ministry is to help the people and as you're coming to see how beautiful beautiful at the feet of them that preach the gospel that announce the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things that's the preacher and that is the pastor and that's how who god has made you and it will be fulfilled in your life in jesus name we're looking at ecclesiastes chapter 12 ecclesiastes chapter 12 and I'm reading here from verse 9, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And here we're reading from verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was what? Because the preacher was, are you there? Wise. Wise. Wise in the use of language. Wise in the presentation of the message wise in the illustrations that will give wise so that the word will sink in and soak in to the hearts of the people it's not just to stand up and talk anybody can do that it's not just to come without preparation without saying these are the sheep that the sheep and these are the lamb and these are the flock that i'm going to talk to today how do i present this how do I show this? How do I reveal this? What illustration do I give? How will this sink into the heart of a sinner and drive him to Calvary? How will this convince a believer and make him to want to evangelize? How will this convince a parent and make him, make him or her to take care of her children? 
how will this convince somebody to stand up and do the work that he ought to do the preacher must be wise and is wise in the presentation of the message that he gives and if you are wise you'll not be all that predictable predictable that means we know what he's going to say he reads a particular verse he read that last week this is what he said and he's going to say exactly the same thing the congregation may be changing there may be people there who were not there the other time and this is very necessary for them and so it says the preacher must be wise was wise and he still taught the people knowledge he taught the people the knowledge of salvation the knowledge of holiness and the knowledge of readiness for the coming of the lord he teaches them the knowledge of what they ought to know yea he gave good heed and he sought out and set in order many principles the word there is proverb but that means principles you see you seek out we don't just come and say well i cannot do like the jays why not i cannot preach like the jays why not i cannot find out that word and that word and that word and put everything together and make it logical why not you seek them out like father like children like father like sons like mother like daughters it, it can happen it will happen i said it will happen you know sometimes i see some people they are teaching and deliberately they will say well we come to the word of god today instead of saying we're going to have points this this and this they just they just go on and then when you challenge them, they say, that's me. Well, that's not you. That's not you. You should be learning. And from the things your pastor does, I'm reproducing pastors. I'm reproducing people like myself. So that you will seek out words and you'll seek out everything. And people will know you are growing. You will grow in Jesus' name. Look at this in verse in verse in verse 10. It says the preacher sought, uh, sought to find out acceptable words. And uh, that that which was written uh, was upright. Even the words of truth. No error, no false doctrine. Just the words of truth. And the words of the wise as goats. And then it says, as nails fastened by the masters of assembly, which are given from one shepherd. And so he tells us that this is how we ought to do it. And the Lord will give us the grace to do that in Jesus' name. P, the pastor is a, tell me, a preacher. A, who is he? An ambassador. Second Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, here reading from verse 18, it talks about the ministry of the pastor, the ministry of the ambassador. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has uh, given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Not ministry of conflict, ministry of separation, ministry of uh, separating families, ministry of dividing, uh, you know, the church and scattering the church. The ministry of reconciliation that we reconcile sinners to God, we show them how to repent, we show them how to forsake their sin and we show them how to come to the Savior, how to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and reconcile them unto God, to which that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not, not uh, imputing uh, their trespasses unto them. And he has given us unto us the, minute, the word of reconciliation. Now, then what follows we are ambassadors paul is saying i'm one of them ambassador and he's saying all the other leaders we all of us were ambassadors for christ as though god did beseech you by us we pray you we plead what you were begging of you in christ uh, in christ said be you reconciled 
unto God. He makes us ambassadors, ambassadors you will be. Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20. For which I am an ambassador in bonds. He was uh, being persecuted at this time, but he still said, even though I'm under persecution, I am still an ambassador. And he says that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. A pastor should speak boldly. An ambassador should speak boldly. There should be no reservation. There should be no timidity in the heart of the pastor, of the ambassador. He's representing the kingdom of God. And he's representing that kingdom to the people before him. He is an ambassador. He speaks with boldness. S is what? Is the shepherd. In Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're reading from verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 36. It tells us in verse 36, and where, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And there are many people like that, they claim to be born again today. But they say that, you know, they feed themselves over the radio. And they feed themselves with some messages uh, from the website of some preachers. And they feed themselves from the television. Or they feed themselves from whatever text uh, somebody is sending uh, to them through the SMS or whatever. They're scattered all abroad. There's no shepherd. And they have no responsibility towards anybody. But there must be a pastor that shepherd the people, oversee the people, and teach the people, assemble the people together. That's why it says in verse 37, Then said he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Then he says, Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth, laborers on to the harvest. There must be shepherd. In fact, uh, if you go back to Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah chapter 23, talking about the shepherd, talking about the pastor. It says, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking says the lord the pastor is a preacher the pastor is an ambassador the pastor is a shepherd and the pastor is a teacher a teacher of the word of god acts of the apostles chapter 18 in acts of the apostles chapter 18 reading from verse 9 acts of the apostles chapter 18 we're reading from verse 9. Acts 18 verse 9. It says, And then speak the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. And hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, the Lord will be with you. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Look at what follows, verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months. What was he doing? Teaching the word of God among them. He stayed with them and he taught them in a systematic way. He taught them in a convincing way. He taught them the word of God. Because he was a pastor. And why is he teaching them? And why are you teaching the people? What's the goal of the teaching? What's the purpose of the teaching? What's the plan as to teach? Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, from verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. We're warning, but we're warning with wisdom. We're preaching, we're preaching with wisdom. And we're teaching, we're teaching with wisdom 
that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now you can tell the interaction. You can tell the association between Paul the Apostle and the people he pastored. You can see there was a personal touch. And you can see that he wanted everyone individually to so get the word and to so pray in the word and for the word to so transform everyone that you'll say i'm presenting everyone perfect to the lord jesus christ now the uh, the pastor is a preacher is an ambassador is a shepherd is a teacher what's the next thing there it's an overseer. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. Say, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, not part of the flock, and to all the flock, not some in the flock, and to all the flock. You know, there are pastors that will very carefully leave um, some difficult people in their congregation you'll say it's chosen to go his way bye bye good riddance that has lessened my body they cannot bear the body of a pastor and the body of a shepherd and that we are to oversee and where to help and where to teach and where to train everybody in the flock once they find somebody almost unteachable almost incorrigible and those people decide i don't want to come under your leadership i want to, to, to come under your teaching you say okay bye bye i don't want any trouble of course you want trouble of course, we want to make sure that everybody in the congregation actually comes to the point he ought to come to. I pray that God will change your attitude in Jesus' name. I see some of our leaders, they just live an easy life. And if, uh, you know, it's the women's section that is uh, saying, please don't touch this area. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And if it's, uh, you know, the students that are saying, hey, Pastor, don't uh, reach uh, this area. We'll do whatever we'll do. They don't have any interest to see how do you have the wisdom? How do you have the courage? How do you have the backbone to make sure that all the flock, you get them to Christ. Eventually, Christ died for everyone. They might be ignorant of that. That they might be ignorant of the ministry that the Lord has called you to and that you are to help everyone. You are not ignorant. You will rise up to your task in Jesus' name. That's why it says, take heed to yourselves. And uh, you're, you're not looking for easy job and easy work to do. Only the things that are easy you concentrate on. But the ones that are difficult to you, that's the work of the shepherd. Didn't you hear the testimony of David? He was telling Saul, I was watching over the flock of my father and a lion came and he took one of the lambs and i went after that lion he endangered his life and he said i smote that lion and i got that lamb out of his mouth another another time a bear came i didn't say i will not die just one lamb out of all this multitude let that one go i'll protect myself we don't do that the work of a shepherd requires that everyone there will feel the touch of your ministry and will feel the transformation that your ministry is granting it will happen in jesus name take heed therefore unto yourselves don't look for easy life and to all the flock over the which the holy ghost has made you made your watch overseers to feed the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood you will do it in jesus name and then they are there is a restorer you'll be a restorer isaiah chapter 49 isaiah chapter 49 and i'm reading from verse 5 and verse 6 isaiah chapter 49 and we're reading from verse 5 it tells us in this passage of scripture about the ministry of the pastor and this ministry is to remind us that 
This is what we do. And now says the Lord that formed me. And says the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. To bring Jacob again to him. You see that? He formed me. And he commissioned me. And he sent me to bring the nation, to bring Israel to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorified in the eyes of the Lord. And my God shall be my strength. Look at verse 6 in particular. And he says, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. And to, to do what? Tell me out loud. To restore the preserved of Israel. That is, they have been scattered all about. Many people have been destroyed. But now, he raises up this servant. He raises up this shepherd. He raises up this pastor. And he says he's to restore, to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles and that, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. And so we find that the pastor is a preacher. The pastor is an ambassador. The pastor is a shepherd. The pastor is a teacher. The pastor is an overseer. And the pastor is a restorer. We're coming to point number three. And the prize... The price of the pastoral ministry. The price of the pastoral ministry. There's a price to pay. And it's um, not uh, a work for the idle. Not a job for those who are lazy. Not a job for those who are not willing to put themselves under some stress. Some strain. Some load. And some work. And I pray that God will make us the kind of people that will pay the price in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Reading from verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be thou strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The grace is available. We can be strong, we're going to be strong. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The things you have heard, everything you have heard, you commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. It may surprise you. There are some situations and some flocks in some communities where some pastors or some preachers will say, I don't think I should say that here. I don't think I can teach that here. I don't think I can emphasize that here. It's not that they are difficult things, but it's because in those communities that uh, the community does not accept that kind of thing. For example, Jesus is the son of God. Very simple. It's a simple statement and it's an important statement and without believing that jesus is the son of god you cannot be saved and jesus is the final sacrifice that's a simple statement without believing that is the final sacrifice you cannot be saved jesus died and was buried and he rose again very simple statement and a factual statement but you see there are some places where if you say that, there will be some unbelievers that will question that. And they will say, no, it cannot be. No, it must not be. And if as a preacher, as a pastor, you must have the courage and the confidence to be able to say, that is it. That is the word of God. Because you want the people there to get saved. And as some people you are preaching to, to just say that God has ordained one man, one wife, until death do us part. Simple statement. An factual statement and something very plain in the scriptures. And over here I can say that with you and it's like, of course, we know that. But there are some places where 
people will question that and say, but how about, but how about? And the preachers who are there, they need to have the backbone and the courage. And I pray that wherever you are, you'll have the backbone and the courage in Jesus' name to emphasize the truth, salient truth of the Bible, salient truth of the word of God, without which the people cannot be saved. That's why it says, the things you have heard, among many witnesses, the same thing, the same truth, you commit to faithful men and faithful women who shall be able to teach others also. Now verse 3, that therefore endure hardness. That's the price to pay. That therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself or the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a civilian. To be what? A soldier. Have that mindset that you're supposed to be a soldier. And you are defending the territory of the kingdom of God. And you are defending the doctrines of the Bible. Honestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. And if a man also strive for the mysteries, yet is he not crowned except a strive lawfully. And the husband man that laboreth must first be partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say consider what i say and the lord give thee understanding in all things the effective pastor must have the meekness of a lamb because you're following after the lord jesus christ who is the lamb of god he must have the meekness of a lamb he must have the vision of an eagle they that wait upon the lord shall mount up with wings like eagles he must have the patience of a donkey the patience of an ass he rode the ass to jerusalem and you must have the patience if you're going to take jesus christ to the people if you're going to make jesus christ to get to the people you have the patience of the donkey and you must have the daring of a lion the righteous is as bold as a lion a person who is uh, easily coward and easily um, controlled and easily stopped, easily muscled, cannot be a pastor. You must have, number one, the meekness of a lamb. Number two, the vision of an eagle. You can see far and you can you are sharp sighted and you see the things you need to pick up in the congregation so that you will help the people in the congregation to be the people they ought to be number one meekness of a lamb number two tell me the vision of an eagle number three is the patience of a donkey the patience of an ass number four is the daring of a lion the daring of a lion the lion is the king of the forest is afraid of no other animal and it's not even afraid of man it's not afraid of the hunter and if you're going to be a pastor that's a price to pay you develop yourself you build up yourself you know that you are in this to rescue people out of the hand of satan to the hand of god therefore you are daring as a lion number five you must have the strength of an ox the strength of an ox is the oxen, oxen the plural of the ox, is the oxen that the farmers use in plowing their field. And the field is there to be plowed. And if we're going to plow this field, and if we're going to sow the seed, and sow the seed of the word of God into the hearts of the people, we must have the strength of the ox and the tenacity of a bulldog. The tenacity of a bulldog. You hold on to that thing. And even if they're going to cut off your hand, you don't lose, you go to, you're going to lose your hand. You're holding on to that thing. The watch of life and the watch of his grace and the watch of his power. You're holding on to that thing. And whatever suffering may come, you have the tenacity of a bulldog and you have the industriousness of an ant. The industriousness of an ant you're always busy always doing something always doing something 
I don't uh, know what happens to the ants, but um, I've never seen any of them resting somewhere, sleeping somewhere, idle somewhere. They're always moving. And if you put an obstacle here, they avoid that obstacle and they keep on moving. And that's what the Lord expects the minister to be. Number one, tell me the meekness of a lamb. Number two, tell me the vision of an eagle. Number three, the patience of a donkey. And number four, the daring of a lion. Number five, the strength of an ox. Number six, the tenacity of a bulldog. Number seven, the industriousness of an ant. You're asking yourself, as you look at the ministry of the pastor, and as you look at the price to pay, how am I going to do it? That's why we pray. That's why we call upon the Lord. That's why we say, Lord, if this is the responsibility you have given me, Lord, I'm going to do it. And I will do it effectively. And you will do it effectively. And by the time I see you again, you'll not be like you were today. Because even though you have grown from the last time I saw you, the next time I see you again, you will grow more in Jesus' name. I was talking about the effective pastor. That's the effective pastor that ought to have all those qualities, not the exemplary pastor. The one who says, I'm going to go beyond the ordinary. I'm going to go beyond just where I've been, and I'm going to go far. The exemplary pastor, he will be a shepherd and a soldier at the same time. A shepherd and a soldier at the same time. The exemplary pastor will, will be able to nourish and comfort and teach. That's a shepherd. But that same pastor will be able to contend and defend and protect because he's a soldier. If we're going to succeed, there's a shepherd attitude. There's the soldier um, aptitude that we have. And we join everything together. And such a pastor must have the faith of the Shunammite. The faith of the Shunammite. What's the faith of the Shunammite? Whatever is happening, is it well with you? Tell me out loud. It is well. Is it well with your family? It is well. Is it well with that child? It is well. You know, but the one that is carrying problem on the face. I'm going through a lot. Sometimes in the valley. Sometimes on the mountain top. It's not an easy road. I'm going through some real hard times, you know, at home. And today I cannot preach because, you know, things are tough. Hey, a pastor who is exemplary must have the faith of the Shunammite. He must have the distinctiveness of Samuel. The distinctiveness of Samuel. Samuel that's able to say, he came to the people I've been here since I was young and I'm now gray-headed which, whose ox have I taken and whose ox have I taken witness against me. The distinctiveness of Samuel. It must have the strength of Samson. The strength of Samson. That whatever the obstacle and whatever the challenge is able to face that challenge, able to face that obstacle by the Spirit of God, by the power of the Lord. The face of the Shunammite, the distinctiveness of Samuel, the strength of Samson, it must have the touch and the wisdom of Solomon. The touch and the wisdom of Solomon is the one that is praying, Oh Lord, give me wisdom. You have put me an overseer, a king, a leader, over so vast a number of people. How can I teach them? How can I lead them? How can I guide them? Except I have your wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. The exemplary pastor must have the touch and the wisdom of Solomon. Number five, he must have the courage of Shadrach and his supporters. Shadrach and his supporters. That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego must have the courage of Shadrach. Because you see, God that Jesus died for all those people anywhere and everywhere. And there may be some people over there like Nebuchadnezzar wanting to hold on to the people and he says, don't talk about that Jesus here. Don't talk about that salvation here. Don't talk about that gospel here. And then if you talk about that, we're going to cast you into that fire. We need a pastor over there that has the courage of Shadrach and his companions. Number six, he must have the conviction of Stephen. 
the conviction of Stephen that in the closet you have so prayed and when you come out your face shines like that of an angel and God gave that man the power the insight and the wisdom that they were not able to gain sail anything he said and when they saw his face it was it was like that of an angel and he must have the importunity of the Syrophoenician the importunity of the Syrophoenician I need help I need healing I need deliverance for my daughter and then there was no answer and she kept on saying Jesus thou son of David have mercy on me my daughter is at home and is suffering and the disciples said send her away and then Jesus said I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and then he said Lord I understand please help me it's not right to give children's bread and give to the dogs yes but the dogs also eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table the importunity of the Syrophoenician that's what the Lord is calling us to the price we're going to pray we're going to pay there's something to pray about so that you will develop by the grace of God the faith of the Shunammite and the distinctiveness of Samuel and the strength of Samson and the wisdom of Solomon and the courage of Shadrach and the conviction of Stephen and the importunity of the Syrophoenician the excelling pastor must maintain a balance between tenderness and softness the pastor must not be all tenderness the pastor must not be all toughness but he must develop a balance between tenderness towards feeble people and toughness towards against false prophets we need both you need to combine those two things tenderness on the one hand towards the people who are feeble but toughness against the people that are false and as we develop all this and say lord make me the pastor i ought to be you'll win more souls to christ you develop more souls in christ and this work of the lord will prosper in your hands in jesus name and who is willing this day to consecrate everything he has to the lord so that this work will prosper in his hands i know you are willing and god will make you able let's rise up and pray to the lord let's tell the lord that's what the lord said he will do he said he'll give us pastors after his own mind pastors after his own heart pastors that will lead the people and feed the people with knowledge you can be one of such pastors you are one already you are one already brother you are one but now pay the price and be who you ought to be sister you are called already and commissioned already rise up and pay the price and say lord i will the lord will help you